1952, soot-filled smoke from London's factories and fireplaces settled on the city, and over the next few days, thousands of people died from the soot and, and, and fumes. For years, the iconic image of Los Angeles was not the Hollywood sign, it was an obscured skyline. And while much progress has been made to clean up this pollution, clouds of sooty smoke continue to blanket homes from Mexico City to Mumbai, harming the health of millions of people. Soot is the visible portion of carbon pollution from smokestacks and tailpipes, burning fields and forests. It sticks to our lungs. It causes asthma and heart disease. It is what gives smoke its ominous color. And as the saying goes, where there is smoke, there is fire. In this case, the fire is increased global warming. The black carbon in soot is one of the most potent warming agents affecting our planet. From diesel trucks to inefficient factories, from the cook stoves in Southeast Asia to the burning forest of the Amazon, black carbon and other components of soot rise into the atmosphere every time we burn fossil fuel or biomass. There, black carbon absorbs sunlight and traps heat. Stuck on water drops and ice crystals, black carbon reduces the cooling effect of clouds. And when black carbon eventually falls out of the air and settles onto ice sheets and mountain snowpack, it accelerates the melting of ice and snow, contributing to rising sea levels and threatening water supplies. Cutting emissions of black carbon could yield rapid benefits for our health and climate. Black carbon only stays in the atmosphere for a few days to weeks before settling out. That means that a global effort to reduce these emissions would act fast to prevent respiratory disease and aid in the fight against global warming pollution. And we already have the technologies needed to achieve deep reductions, including particle filters, improved diesel engines, and inefficient cook stoves. Developing and installing these technologies would create jobs and move us forward in the clean energy economy. Now, I am sure there are some who would argue that if we cut black carbon pollution, we can delay on reducing greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. This simply will not address the momentous challenge that we face. For home buyers, a solid down payment can keep the mortgage more manageable, but they still have to make the monthly payments. If we want to keep the planet a viable residence, a down payment in the form of black carbon reductions won't replace the need to make sustained investments in clean energy. Each year of delay will make it more difficult to keep temperatures from rising, and it will continue to put the American economy at a competitive disadvantage. We recently took steps to cut black carbon and greenhouse gas pollution. Last year, the House passed the Waxman-Markey American Clean Energy and Security Act, which will set us on a pollution-cutting path and at the same time create millions of new jobs, making America the global leader of the clean energy economy. Working with Representative Inslee, we incorporated a number of provisions that would cut emissions of black carbon here at home and seek opportunities to curb emissions abroad. This will provide innumerable benefits for our health and for our climate. The deadly soot-filled London fog of 1952 encouraged the UK to enact their own clean air laws in 1956. My hope today is that even in the fog of war that sometimes envelops our progress on clean energy and climate change, that we can still clear the smoke to find common ground on issues like black carbon. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses and hearing from them how Congress can help address this important issue. I would now like to uh, recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. There is so much controversy about how to confront climate change that sometimes there seems to be no common ground. However, by taking a realistic approach to black carbon, we can have a positive effect on the environment without breaking the bank. 
which is something that both Democrats and Republicans should support. Black carbon, which is essentially soot, doesn't get the attention that CO2 receives. That's too bad, because the more focus on black carbon would produce immediate results for the environment without requiring the types of regulation that stifle the economy. Scientists are learning that black carbon is one of the leading contributors to climate change. Most global emissions of black carbon come from energy-related combustion and the burning of biomass. By coating both the air and the planet's surface with soot, black carbon absorbs heat at a dangerous rate. But unlike CO2, which hangs in the atmosphere for decades, black carbon lingers for only days at a time. It's also easier for society to address the emissions of black carbon. There are already a number of ways to reduce these emissions without relying on the cost prohibitive technologies that CO2 regulations would require. Most of the world's black carbon is produced in Asia. Surprisingly, when it comes to black carbon, the U.S. isn't cast as the bad guy, as North America produces less than Europe, South America, and Africa. But much of the black carbon produced in the developing world could be offset with simple technology and techniques. Improved farming and forestry policies would go a long way toward reducing the soot. So would cleaner burning stoves, which are already readily available and could be cheaply deployed in many of the developing nations where dirty, inefficient stoves are commonly used. It will be a lot cheaper to buy clean stoves for developing nations than to implement draconian CO2 regulations. As Congress struggles over how to confront climate change, black carbon reductions, targeted investments in research and development, and improved transmission are cost-effective options that could have large impacts without crippling our economy. I want to welcome Dr. Drew Schindel of NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, who will talk about the immediate impact that could result from cleaning up black carbon emissions. Hybrid truck legislation that I have introduced would also help black carbon. Diesel engines are a primary source of black carbon since most trucks use diesel. Reducing fuel use in trucks would reduce both CO2 and black carbon emissions. My bill would create a grant program in the Department of Energy to fund research and development of hybrid truck technology. This is one approach that's simple and affordable. There are many others, and I hope today's hearing leads to more understanding of this problem and its solutions. Thank you. I thank the gentleman very much. Uh, all time for opening statements of members has been completed. We'll turn to our first witness, <coughs> who is uh, Dr. Tammy Bond. She is a professor at, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Dr. Bond's research considers the interactions between energy use, the composition of the atmosphere, and the global science system. Uh, we welcome you. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Ranking Member Sensenbrenner um, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss black carbon and its role in climate change. I'm really honored to be here and to participate in the committee's important discussions as you explore a wide variety of solutions to clean energy and climate change. I've been working on black carbon for about 15 years. I do everything from um, models of emissions in the atmosphere to measurements of diesel engines and cook stoves. So although I sit in front of a computer most of the time, I've definitely gotten my hands dirty. Black carbon is the dark component of smoke. I'm going to start by giving you an idea of what a powerful climate impact it has, putting some numbers on what Mr. Markey said. One ounce of black carbon in the atmosphere absorbs about the amount of sunlight that would fall on a tennis court. This light turns into heat and warms the atmosphere. One pound of black carbon absorbs about 650 times as much energy during its short lifetime as one pound of emitted CO2 does during 100 years. An old diesel truck, not our current regulations, um, but an old diesel truck driving for 20 miles would emit about a third of an ounce of black carbon. That's about the weight of two nickels. That would heat the atmosphere during a short lifetime as much as adding a home furnace to it. Now, after a week, that heating is gone because the particles fall out of the atmosphere. If they fall on snow, they can warm it and melt it. Over that same 20 miles, the same truck will emit about 70 pounds of CO2, and that would add five times the warming of the black carbon, but spread over 100 years. So there are 
two major effects, one short, one long. Estimates of black carbon forcing or the atmospheric warming today are between 20% and 60% of carbon dioxides. We have high confidence that atmosphere and snow forcing by black carbon and its interaction with sunlight leads to warming and is significant in comparison with greenhouse gases. One of the uncertainties, however, is how those same emissions change clouds. I'd like to add an analogy to that uh, of Mr. Markey. Reducing black carbon emissions is a short-term solution to climate change. It's a bit like applying an emergency brake to a car that's out of control. You slow the vehicle quickly, get a little time to think, but your vehicle will still run away if you don't take your foot off the gas pedal, if CO2 emissions are maintained. The estimate, estimated emission rate of black carbon is about 8.3 million tons per year. Total emissions from the United States are about 460,000 tons. That's about 5.5% of the global total. Of this total, that is the global total, diesel engines provide about a quarter. Solid fuels like wood and coal burned for home cooking and heating are also about a quarter. Small industries are about 10% and open forest and grassland burning is the remaining 40%. There are uncertainties in global emissions. The totals are probably underestimated, especially in developing countries. However, we are confident that the sources I mentioned are very large contributors to global black carbon. It's important to note that there are international initiatives working on both diesel engines and cook stoves. This doesn't mean that they have all the resources they need. I've given you a very simple picture, however. Sources that emit black carbon also emit several other pollutants, cooling particles that reflect light away from the earth, and gases that warm the earth by changing ozone and methane. You can think of each source like a bathroom faucet. The mixed water can be very warm if you turn on the black carbon or the gases, very cold if you turn on the cooling particles, and the net result depends on the balance. So sources with high emissions of warming pollutants are the most promising targets for reducing warming. Of the sources I listed above, diesel engines are the richest in warming pollutants by far, followed by residential cooking and heating, industrial sources, and last open burning of biomass. Since the late 1800s, emissions in the United States have gradually transitioned from residential wood and coal to industry to diesel engines. This development track is common through much of the world. In countries at low levels of development, black carbon emissions come mainly from solid fuels for heating and cooking. In developed regions like the United States and Europe, the main sources are diesel engines. There are three big drivers of cleaning up black carbon. First, technology. Our very first success was in the use of pulverized coal boilers to um, increase coal use and yet reduce black carbon emissions at the same time. Second, clean fuels. Introduction of natural gas, electricity, and liquefied petroleum gas has played a large role in cleaning up residential emissions. That's just one example. And finally, regulation and government participation in technology development such as the initiative that Mr. Sensenbrenner mentioned. These have driven advanced technologies and retrofit programs for diesel, for example. Now, to confirm that reducing sources rich in black carbon will benefit... Yep, if, if you could just summarize, please. I'm on my last paragraph. To confirm that reducing sources rich in black car carbon will benefit climate, we have to estimate the net effect of cleaning up individual emission sources our best estimate of cloud response to particle emissions, which is very important. Um, I and three other scientists are leading a group of about 30 co-authors in a study to assess those questions, and we expect to have a product in June. I don't think that all the questions about black carbon will be solved by June, but that report should be able to tell us which actions can be taken soon and what targeted research is needed to evaluate actions in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bond, very much. <clears throat> Our second witness is Dr. V. Ramanathan. He is a distinguished professor of atmospheric sciences at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. 
and the director of the Center for Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, he is uh, the chair of the National Academy of Sciences panel that provides strategic advice to the U.S. Climate Change Science Program. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Is your microphone on down there? Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can I start over or get 20 seconds? Oh, all right. Uh, my own work is using uh, autonomous unmanned aircraft vehicles to measure this absorption of sunlight uh, by black carbon directly. We also use instrumented aircraft like the Gulf aircraft and we have followed black carbon transport all the way from China across the Pacific Ocean into the US, so these things travel long distances. We also have stations in the Himalayas and in the Sierras to see how the black carbon settling on the snow darkens the snow and causes the melting, and we have me measurements for all of this phenomenon. And the first thing we have to recognize, uh, I first of all, I completely agree with the opening statements by both the chairman and the uh, ranking member. Um, the, the BC impact there to recognize impacts at local and through the air pollution and health, regional scales, and I'll talk about that, and global scales in terms of global warming. The regional scale is black carbon influences cloud formation and heats the air around it, disrupts rainfall patterns such as the monsoon in India, and the deposition of black carbon on bright snow surfaces darkens ice and snow. And this, along with the warming of the air by BC, contributes to the warming of the Arctic. My colleague, Dr. Shindal, will talk about it, as well as the elevated regions of the Himalayan Tibetan glaciers and snowpacks. Thus, b black carbon is directly linked with the water budget of the planet. Reverting to the global warming effect of BC, current estimates show contribution of BC black carbon to heat addition of the planet is as much as 20% to 60% of that due to carbon dioxide. The 60% value is my estimate with Professor Carmichael, in which we constrained it with the global network of uh, instruments and aircraft data. As has been mentioned, BC is an important fast action tool in mitigating long-term warming due to greenhouse gases. To give an example, reducing black carbon emissions by 50% today will lead to a 50% reduction in the heat trap by them within few months. So thus policymakers will witness the success of their actions during their tenure. I think there'll also be great opportunity to test climate scientists' theories and models. And it's instructive to compare the potential of BC as a mitigation tool with that of CO2 reduction. The man-made carbon dioxide blanket weighs a staggering 880 billion tons. The weight of black carbon in the blanket is a minuscule 250,000 tons, except it almost has half the effect of CO2. However, we have to point out, CO2 reductions are required to avert, avert large warming. For example, we are currently adding about 35 gigatons every year, and it's growing at a rate of two to three percent. At this rate, we'll be adding another 1,500 billion tons of CO2 during this century. So black carbon reduction should be thought of as complementary and not as supplementary CO2. As has been pointed out, two important targets for reductions of black carbon are those generated by diesel and BC generated by cooking with biomass fuels. For example, I'm working in a village in India trying to understand replacing the cook stove the traditional cook stoves with nearly smoke-free cook stoves, how much climate warming we would gain. So the last thing I want to conclude, the science of black carbon climate link, we have to understand is relatively new compared to we have spent over, over four or five decades understanding the issue of CO2. And as a result, every month we are finding out yet another way in which black carbon impacts the environment. So this is a science in the making. Just want to give you three major examples, the interaction of black carbon within clouds and the impact on precipitation and cloud extent. This might emerge as a, one of the bigger issues. The, the role of black carbon atmospheric heating and ice snow darkening 
its role on the observed warming and melting of the alpine glaciers and snowpack. It's an emerging science. Lastly, impact of black carbon on the Arctic warming and sea ice retreat, which I think will be covered by my colleague, Dr. Schindel. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Doctor, very much. Our next witness is Dr. Drew Schindel, uh, a senior scientist at uh, NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Uh, he is also a lecturer uh, in the Earth and Environment Sciences at Columbia uh, University. Uh, one of his uh, many distinctions, he received a National Science Foundation Antarctic Service Medal and a Scientific American Top 50 Scientist Award. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. I'd like to first thank the committee for the opportunity to testify this morning. Direct observations of climate seldom reveal cause and effect, so that the influence of black carbon on surface temperature must be estimated using models as well as data. Several independent methods have find broadly similar results with an overall global mean warming to, uh, due to black carbon that is about 15 to 55 percent of the warming due to carbon dioxide, as we've heard. Black carbon has likely had even larger regional effects, especially in areas such as the Arctic due to its strong impact on snow and ice. Black carbon affects other aspects of climate in addition to surface temperature. Several studies have indicated that the large amounts of smoke and haze observed near Asia can cause shifts in the monsoon. The physical mechanism linking black carbon to changes in precipitation is clear and operates worldwide. Unlike temperature changes, shifts in precipitation nearly always have negative net economic impacts as long-term infrastructure has quite sensibly been designed for norms over past decades. Actual policies will usually impact emissions of many compounds simultaneously since incomplete combustion produces substantial amounts of other particulates and gases in addition to black carbon. <clears throat> Hence, it's necessary to examine the net impacts of all emissions from a particular activity on climate. Furthermore, emissions of pollutants also affect the quality of the air we breathe. Policies typically treat the air quality and climate effects separately, however. Encouragingly, research has shown that the optimal strategies to reduce black carbon and the ozone precursors carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, and methane are similar whether the goal is, is improving air quality or limiting global warming. This argues for a stronger emphasis on reduction in emissions of these pollutants in air quality policies for which there would be a climate co-benefit and in climate policies for which there would be an air quality co-benefit. Research suggests that strategies to simultaneously improve air quality and mitigate global warming differ from region to region. In the U.S., reductions in overall emissions from diesel vehicles appears to achieve both goals, with a substantial part of the benefits coming from reduced black carbon. More generally, increases in fuel efficiency coupled with reductions in emissions from both gasoline and diesel fuel vehicles show the most positive results for climate and air quality. In contrast, many countries in the developing world use fuel with high sulfur content, as the U.S. did years ago. Hence, in developing Asia, where particulate emissions are larger than in any other part of the world, reductions in emissions from both industrial processes and residential cooking stoves offer ways to simultaneously improve air quality and mitigate warming. The health benefits that would be gained from reductions in particulate and ozone concentrations are clear from epidemiological studies. While these benefits are most strongly felt in nearby population, long-range transport of air pollution can also be substantial, and hence the health impacts of air pollution are not simply a local issue. Climate impacts extend even more broadly. Particulates also impair visibility with detrimental impacts on tourism and recreation. Elevated levels of, of ozone cause damage to plants, leading to economic losses from reduced agricultural and forestry yields and decreased food security. Many projects to control black carbon, carbon monoxide, volatile organics, and methane emissions may therefore have higher benefits than costs, even without including any value from reduced warming. For example, both state and federal diesel emissions regulations have shown human health benefits five times or more than the cost of implementing the regulations. Air pollution leads to 70 to $270 billion in damages per year in the United States alone, so there's clearly a great deal of potential for co-benefits, including health care cost savings. Though further research is clearly needed to reduce uncertainties, we can already conclude that reductions in emissions of black carbon are likely to be a useful component of strategies to mitigate climate change. 
Realistic emissions reductions would affect several types of particles and gases and thus require careful analysis of their net impact. In summary, while there is more to learn, several things are already clear. Reductions in emissions of products of incomplete combustion will virtually always improve health, and by targeting emissions rich in black carbon, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, and methane, many options are available that will simultaneously mitigate climate change. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor. And our final uh, witness is uh, Conrad Schneider. He is the advocacy director of the Clean Air Task Force, a nonprofit environmental research, education, and legal advocacy organization. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Sitchin Brenner, <coughs> members of the committee. My name is Conrad Schneider, Advocacy Director of the Clean Air Task Force, and I want to thank you personally for the leadership that you and this committee have shown on the issue of climate change and for the work done in passing the Waxman-Markey Bill. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today regarding policy options for reducing black carbon emissions. The Waxman-Markey Bill made an excellent start in de dealing with this issue, and we appreciate you revisiting it today because it represents a promising approach that deserves immediate attention both in the Climate Bill and in other legislation currently before Congress. At the outset of today's hearing, I just want to make one thing very clear. Addressing black carbon and the other short-lived climate forcing agents, such as methane and ozone, is not a substitute for enacting comprehensive climate change legislation to deal with carbon dioxide emissions. We're going to need both and then some in order to address the climate crisis. Uh, imagine, I want to try to give a sense of urgency to this uh, hearing as well in these solutions. Imagine a world in which the Arctic is literally melting, that the Arctic Ocean is about to become ice-free, we're told, that per uh, permafrost is melting, potentially releasing millennial stores of carbon dioxide and methane, and we're searching globally, we're searching for strategies that can counteract this uh, situation almost immediately. And we find a strategy that not only can act immediately to do so, but it could save hundreds of thousands of lives globally. We don't have to imagine very much. That's the situation we face today, and reducing black carbon is a strategy that can deliver those immediate uh, benefits. Um, in fact, some experts uh, estimate that um, global warming, uh, that black carbon emissions to reduce global warming could deliver as much as one to two of the Sokolov wedges that you all are familiar with. Um, the goals of trying to use a variety of different steps to meet uh, the carbon mitigation initiative's uh, 200 billion ton goal. And as you've heard, car um, black carbon is not only a climate forcing agent, it is a, a potent, deadly air pollutant. In the U.S., we've estimated that diesel particulate emissions alone will cause over 21,000 premature deaths this year. But uh, in this, so black carbon is a win-win for climate and public health, but given the tremendous environmental and health benefits of reducing it, relatively little is being done in the U.S. or globally to actually attack this problem. The previous, previous panelists identified diesel engines, cook stoves, and agriculture burning as the most controllable sources of black carbon, so I'm going to focus there today on the policies that we can use to attack them. Now, last year, due in part to the leadership of Representative Inslee, Congress directed the U.S. EPA to, to study the issue of black carbon and report back early next year, about a year from now. It's supposed to inventory the sources, assess the potential metrics, and identify the most cost-effective approaches for reductions. Now, at one level, the solutions for these source categories are pretty simple. For diesel engines, there are filters available today that can trap up to 90% of this pollution. For cook stoves, the key is replacing existing smoking cook stoves with more efficient cook stoves. And for agriculture burning, it involves shifting the burning away from the spring season and using pyrolysis to turn waste into biochar that sequesters carbon and increases agricultural productivity. However, all of this is easier said than done. There are over 11 million diesel engines in use today without filters, tens of millions globally. Half the people on Earth use inefficient cook stoves, and unnecessary agriculture burning persists in many places. For diesels, the needed policies boil down to two things, and the kind of things that you don't want to hear necessarily, mandates and money. The U.S. and the EU have adopted new engine standards that are going to reduce this emissions by 90 percent, but it will take decades before they're fully effective. In the meantime, we really need to focus on retrofitting the existing diesel fleet with these filters. Now, the Waxman-Markey bill directed EPA to exercise its existing authority over black carbon, and the lion's share, as you've heard in the United States, comes from diesels. 
But unfortunately, the EPA under the Clean Air Act has the authority to regulate only 1 million out of those 11 million diesel engines. An analysis by MJ Bradley Associates estimated that targeting just that million could achieve the climate benefits of removing 21 million cars from the road and would save approximately 7,500 lives, yet EPA has failed to act. On the money side, the Kerry Boxer bill that passed the Senate uh, committee devoted a portion of that bill's allowance allocation proceeds to fund the Diesel Emission Reduction Act, DERA. DERA passed in 2005 and authorized a billion dollars over five years to clean up diesel. However, it's been chronically underfunded. The Recovery Act provided $300 million for DERA, but EPA received $2 billion worth of applications for that money and is sitting on $1.7 billion worth of project applications that could cut black carbon emissions significantly today. Additional funding for DERA should be included in any jobs bill that passes this year, and since DERA expires next year, it should be reauthorized and fully funded. In addition, the upcoming transportation bill reauthorization offers the opportunity to reduce black carbon from diesel construction equipment. We believe that work on federally funded transportation infrastructure projects should be accomplished with clean diesel equipment paid for through the transportation bill funds. And the associated general contractors, the people who own that equipment, they agree. Last year, we negotiated a set of joint clean construction principles with AGC. Now Representative Hall of this committee, with the support of several members here, is championing the effort to see that those principles are included in the transportation bill. For cook stoves, the waxman markey bill calls for providing assistance to foreign countries to reduce black carbon emissions and specifically outlines actions to provide affordable stoves for developing countries. It notably also provides a set of performance standards, which are excellent. However, the bill did not allocate any allowances or auction proceeds to fund the program. The U.S. should lead in the creation of jointly funded international programs to develop regionally appropriate strategies to deploy these stoves. But they face many other challenges as well, including cultural acceptance of the stoves, the need for on-site verification of mitigation, and cheaper stoves that can be deployed at scale. And lastly, stemming agricultural fires in the spring when Arctic ice and snow is most affected by the deposition of black carbon requires overcoming cultural resistance to long-held agriculture practices. Black carbon emissions from spring agriculture burning in the northern latitudes are highest in Eurasia and North America in the Grain Belt. Black carbon emissions can transport directly from there into the Arctic, darkening the surfaces there and accelerating melting. So these fires present a clear target for mitigation. So in conclusion, policies targeting black carbon emissions offer a viable climate strategy that can be implemented without delay, that will deliver immediate climate benefits using technology that is available today, and moreover, they can deliver important public health protections from one of the most potent and widespread air pollution-related public health threats. Uh, winning these policies will not be easy, but their significant benefits make them extremely cost-beneficial, and they co may constitute our best hedge against near-term climate impacts. So thank you. Recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, this is really an excellent panel, Dr. Bond. If I'd have someone like you in college, I would have fulfilled my fantasies of becoming a, a physicist. So thanks for your educational work here. Um, first question, is black carbon a proxy for the health benefits of reduction of other emissions associated with fossil fuels? If we reduce black carbon, do we get the benefits almost by necessity of reductions of other emissions, or are they different? There's a lot of similarity, and there are some differences. Um, and black carbon is just a component of particulate matter, which has uh, severe health impacts. And so you can reduce particulate matter and also reduce black carbon, or you can reduce particulate matter, and if you don't target black carbon sources, then you don't get the black carbon reductions. Now, your question was the other way around. If you reduce black carbon, do you always get the health benefits? In fact, the health benefits are more clear for black carbon reductions than the climate benefits. The climate benefits um, are, they have some uncertainty, there are sources for which we are confident in the climate benefit, but the health benefits are always existing. 
So let me ask a, a little different question. If we made an investment in our diesel transportation fleet of X dollars right now, and our interest was on the health impacts, would the best investment to be, at least in the short term, the filtration systems to capture black carbon and then get health benefits associated with that, or would there be a better investment for better health impacts? Dr. Mr. Mayor? I'll try to take that one. Um, um, the Clean Air Task Force has analyzed the benefits of looking at power plant pollution cleanup, diesel pollution cleanup, car pollution cleanup from both a health perspective and from a climate perspective. And uh, if you factor in, if you take into combination both the health and the climate benefits, there is no better investment than in a particle filtration system. Particles are the most deadly air pollutant. Black carbon may deliver the most, the fastest climate benefits. So to take into, and, and then you have a technology that can deliver a 90 percent reduction in the particulate slash black carbon, you've got a real winner for a technology. Um, I introduced this black carbon bill, I don't know, about a year, year and a half ago, and it seemed to me the right thing to do. But since then, I've seen a, um, a documentary showing the, the soot on the surface. It was either the, the Arctic or Greenland, and I can't recall which it was. But it showed these depressions. The, the whole sheet of ice I saw had these depressions. And at the bottom of the depression, there'd be this patch of black soot. And I mean black soot against the white ice. And I mean, it was just, it looked like the entire cap was, was covered with this stuff, at least at the bottom of each one of these little melt pools. Um, it caught my attention. And I guess the question is, is the albedo effect of black carbon, how does that compare to the general climate change when it's in the atmosphere? Is it just a small part of the problem or a big part of the problem? Maybe I can answer part of that question. If you look at global warming effect of black carbon, this albedo effect contributes about 10 percent of the total black carbon effect. But if you look at in the Arctic heat budget of the Arctic, or in the, in the alpine glaciers, then the darkening effect may be the dominant effect because the black carbon warming comes from trapping sunlight in the air. But locally, all the sea ice and, and the glaciers and the ice sheets, the darkening effect may very well be the dominant effect. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We, we believe that anywhere where there, there are snow and ice, the, the effect, as you've seen, uh, you've been describing occurs. In places like the Himalayas, the results are somewhat more ambiguous because you have a fair amount of wind-blown dust and other types of pollutants that are already deposited on those glaciers. So it, it almost certainly contributes, but how much it contributes there is more ambiguous. In the Arctic, which tends to be very far from, from, say, dust sources, the snow is very clean, so the effect is extremely large. And there we believe that it, it's, it's quite possible that black carbon is responsible for over half of the, of the accelerated melting we've seen in the last few decades, or at least over, over say, the 20th century. Um, do, so do, that's, you the, do you mean the albedo effect from the black carbon? Is that well, it, it is both the effect of black carbon in the atmosphere and the albedo effect. And, and the effect on albedo is obviously very local, but even the effect in the atmosphere has an extra powerful impact on the Arctic because most of the sources are from the northern hemisphere industrialized or developing nations, which means that their emissions are closer. So unlike CO2, which just drifts around uniformly everywhere, the black carbon being physically emitted in the northern hemisphere fairly close to the Arctic allows it to have an even stronger impact on the Arctic than it does on the global average. Uh, Mr. Schneider, you pointed out what sounded like a potential imperfection of the Waxman-Markey bill, which we don't believe there could ever be an imperfection on that work of art. <laughs> but you did make reference to, I thought, that, that the the provision that would implement a regulation on black carbon would apply only to one million of the 11 million units. Could you explain that? I, I, I will, and thank you very much. And let me just offer another opportunity to, to thank and commend the committee and the, and the, the people who worked so hard on that bill. Um, and I appreciate you all revisiting the issue today, uh, hopefully to maybe strengthen the black carbon pr provisions, which are already, um, you know, the best um, in any in any bill. Um, 
And by the way, if there is an imperfection, it's not those two gentlemen's <laughs> responsibility. I'll, I'll take full responsibility. I, I, I suspect I, that I, I when I actually praised Congressman Inslee in my opening statement <laughs> for the provision. So I, I think he deserves full credit for everything that is. In I can that. testify Inclu to that. Including imperfections. <laughs> so. the, um, the, the bill uh, basically directs EPA to exercise its existing authority over all sources of black carbon. The, the largest, nearly 60 percent of that, is being the U.S. being diesel. So sort of, it's sort of directing EPA to deal with diesels. And the, 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 the imperfection, if there is one, is not in the Waxman-Markey bill. It's in the Clean Air Act, which um, gives EPA only the authority to, to, in terms of in-use diesels to deal with a very small slice of those engines. The only provision in the Clean Air Act that, that, that allows that is one called, or it's a rebuild provision. Whenever any truck engines are rebuilt, that is sort of taken from an old, sort of rebuilt to be in a new, EPA has the authority to issue more stringent emission standards for those rebuilt engines. And in this country, um, over the next decade, we project that only about one million vehicles will rebuild in that way. So if EPA used, exercised, as you directed them, to uh, use the full extent of their authority, they could only cover that one million uh, set of rebuilding engines over that period of time. whereas. The end-use fleet is 11 million. Uh, that would include all the other trucks that don't get rebuilt and would include all the off-road engines, the construction equipment uh, and, and other um, uh, engines. EPA has, right now has no authority over those, and the courts have said so. I mean, it's very clear that that's constrained. So one of the first things we would say that needs to be fixed in that regard is to give EPA broader regulatory authority to uh, require uh, filters and after-treatment devices on the existing fleet, and we promote the idea of doing that in conjunction with incentives to turn over the fleet faster and potentially economic incentives like in the Diesel Emission Reduction Act to pay for some of that. But, um, but one of the things that's holding us back right now is we have this sort of golden opportunity to deal with these, these, these sources, which are public health threats and climate um, forcers, but EPA really can't um, go much further. I, I, you know, I, I don't know, mean to be overly critical, but I, but I would point out also that even with respect to the engine rebuild rule, EPA is aware that, um, that that authority exists and is studying the question, looking at the question of whether to exercise that authority. And we hope they will shortly, but to date they have not. And what's the best assessment of the costs associated with that that's been done already? In terms of the, um, the rebuild rule itself? Yes. Um, I believe that to deal with those, those million engines, depending on what, what you know, not every engine can take the most advanced type of filter, so you have sort of a mixture of solutions. It's several, bil several billion dollars with a B to, com to comply with that. Right. Um, so next question, does from, is, to what extent is black carbon an issue on our coal-fired utility plants? We've talked about diesel. Is black carbon an issue at all with coal-fired? utility plants? Not to the best of our knowledge. The combustion in a coal plant is good enough that it burns out all the black carbon, and that has changed in the last 100 years, but that's been one of our successes. So there may be particulate matter, but most of it isn't black. And I just was reading a, a little blurb today about a UN program to improve uh, residential, you know, stoves, essentially, in the sub-Saharan African area to try to get the more efficient stoves. Is this a viable strategy uh, on an international basis? What would it take to really have a meaningful system to improve the efficiency of these? Open question. I'll say something. I'm sure Dr. Ramanathan will want to speak as well. Two answers, as any good scientist would give you, or any good economist. Um, first, yes it is, because people want new technologies. Um, people want clean cooking. And, of course, there are some cultural barriers, but it's definitely a potential solution. The second answer is that you have to be careful how you do it. We've learned quite a lot about how to improve residential combustion. That includes both what to do and what not to do. What not to do is to parachute in, drop a bunch of improved stoves, and hope that people accept them. 
Um, but there's a lot of history in that field. Um, and, and as mentioned, you need to work with the communities, follow up, and above all, think big scale. And that involves both technological and um, implementation innovation. I'll just follow that for India and South Asia. Uh, in India alone, roughly 150 million households use uh, mud stoves using firewood and cow dung. There's been a long history of trying to replace this, and by and large, they have failed. And we got into this just since last year. We've taken a small village, and the first thing we found was the technologies were not ready. I mean, they were sort of built in a laboratory and really didn't adapt to village conditions. And just in the last year or two, uh, there are several companies, Shell and uh, British Petroleum, have come with improved stoves. So also some uh, US-based. Uh, and they, we find now, we have tried five of them. And uh, I'm, I'm not allowed to give the names yet because we haven't published the data. At least one of them seems to do the job. The women are happy with it. I'm happy with it because it cuts down the black carbon emissions. So it's a convergence of the scientific interest of reducing pollution and cooking with something which is adaptable to local taste. So I think the technology is almost there. The last thing I want to mention is that India has now started on a major cookstove program nationwide, and it's not clear which way that program is going. You mean not clear w whether it's going clean or unclean? Uh, no, I mean, uh, to uh, cleaner cook stoves. India's program is towards cleaner cook stoves. Got it. I'm going to ask one more. This question is a little farther afield of this hearing, but I'll ask Dr. Bond. Um, I've experienced a lot of frustration at the lack of understanding uh, in a lot of places, including the U.S. Congress, about science associated with climate change, ocean acidification, black carbon, and the like. And one of the sources of frustration is that the information the scientific community has does not get shared with members of the U.S. Congress. They just don't have an appreciation for one reason or another because they haven't heard from scientists enough, frankly. Um, I, I'm surprised that, you know, we have people walking around here today uh, in the U.S. Capitol who are grieved they're petitioning their government for redress of grievances on a, in a certain sort of direction. But I haven't seen scientists up here demanding action from the U.S. Congress, except in the most restrained, polite, academic, uh, almost silent ways. Um, if I was a scientist and I knew what, frankly, a lot of scientists know in this country is going on out there in, in the planet and the climatic systems and, and in the oceans, I'd, I'd be uh, in somebody's grill about that, um, telling them that we need action. And yet you just don't see that from the scientific community, with very few exceptions. We, we got a letter from, I think, 250 scientists last week, I read, saying, wake up and smell the roses. This problem is still there, even though there were some nasty emails out of England. But that's about it, a letter, not a personal laying down on the tracks. Why doesn't that happen? Should it happen? And how do we engage the scientific community to be more sharing of the information they have when it needs to be shared? I'm focusing on you, Dr. Bond, because you're an educator and you're responsible for the future crop of scientists that we're going to depend upon. Thank you, Mr. Inslee. Um, I think it was just Monday when I told my air quality modeling class that some of them should run for office. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. That's helped, that, that'd be great, just not against me. It just, yeah. <laughs> no, you're, you're well established enough. I think I voted for you when I was at uh, University well, I of I appreciate that. <laughs> at, at any rate, this is a, this is a difficult question and it, it has to do with the, the <clears throat> nature of scientists and how they approach science. If you, if you have an action outcome, uh, one is almost af afraid that you'll affect the science because you're supposed to look at it dispassionately. And so how we conduct our business 99.9% .9 of the time, we must step back from what we want the outcome to be. We're not allowed to want an outcome. And 
perhaps that leads to a disconnect between us and the people like you and like the rest of the committee who are able to put that science into action so, so wonderfully to think of so many measures as Mr. Schneider outlined um, to implement action in the society. I don't have a good answer for you. I can't advise the scientific community to become more passionate because they want to be very careful, and that's a very important component of the scientific method. But I can say that if you, if you perhaps had discussions like this one, or even more informal discussions in which there was mixing between a committee like yourself and a group of scientists, that the communication um, might flow a little more easily. Well, I just take this one opportunity to encourage the scientific community to figure out a way to be dispassionate objectively, but passionate about sharing the information they do have with the people who can give effect to those policies. And I think, I, I think that's possible in the human intellect to do both of those things. And if we don't have the scientific community doing that right now, we're not going to solve this problem because people, frankly, won't know about it. And this is great to have our committee doing this, but if we don't have scientists getting people and shaking them by the collars to get them to understand how significant this problem is, people are sleepwalking over a cliff. And frankly, the scientific community are the people vested with the intellect and knowledge who have the ability to get people to wake up. So I'm, I'm just pleading with you as members of the scientific community to try to engage your members and colleagues in an effort to educate the U.S. Congress because I think the moment demands it, and we don't have a lot of time. Thank you. Great. Thank the um, gentleman very much. Um, let me ask this question. The, the temperatures in Alaska have warmed six degrees Fahrenheit since 1950. Could any of you comment on the role that black carbon has played uh, in terms of the changes that are occurring in, Aska, uh, in Alaska are in the Arctic? Well, that's, that's something that, as I mentioned in my statement, cause and effect is very difficult to understand simply from observations because you only have one way that the real world happened to behave. So what's, what's been happening that's distinct since the 50s is that while concentrations of CO2 have been rising steadily, concentrations of different types of particulate have been changing like, with time. <coughs> After the Clean Air Act, some have gone down and in different locations. And so we can identify the pattern and try to, try to attribute cause and effect to those. And the difficulty there is that the effect of sulfate, which is something we've controlled well because of acid rain, looks very similar to the, pair, the pattern of black carbon. So what we can see is that in, in these kind of studies, more than half of the rapid warming in the Arctic is attributable to particulate, but some of that is due to reduction in sulfate and some due to increases in black carbon, both of which have been taking place largely in the last 30 years. So it's very hard to, to really separate the two. Probably a third to a half or a slightly more is the best number. Dr. Lamanathan? It's, <clears throat> I think just to echo what was said, we've been doing this air pollution reduction almost to speed up the warming. You know, we talked about the smoke in the blanket, the sulfates and other aerosols act like mirrors on the blanket reflecting sunlight and shielding this greenhouse warming. So since 1975, we have decreased the sulfate pollution quite a bit, almost 25% globally. But just in the uh, Arctic nations, the reduction in the North America and, and Europe is almost <coughs> 50%. So the unmasking of the warming is definitely contributing to the Arctic warming. And the second thing which is happening contributing to the warming is the fossil fuel black carbon has increased. Not all black carbon is same. You know, the biomass black carbon cools a lot less compared to fossil fuel black carbon. So there are three things which are happening at the same time to contribute to the Arctic and the Alaskan warming. One is the increase in the greenhouse gases, 
reduction in sulfur pollution and unmasking the warming, and the third is increase in the fossil fuel black carbon. So what fraction that is, I have to leave it to a modeling scientist like Dr. Shindao. Could you talk a little bit about that trend and the uh, role that that could play in reducing uh, black carbon? Sure. Um, first of all, a lot of, the, a lot of the discussion in this country around uh, electric vehicles and plug hybrids <coughs> is in the light duty sector. We, we don't have a lot of diesel vehicles in the light duty sector here as, they, as, as, as in other countries, and particularly EU. Um, so um, a conversion of the light duty fleet to more electric vehicles and more plug hybrids is critical um, with respect to the reduction of greenhouse gases, but probably won't make much of a difference with respect to black carbon reductions. Um, Representative Sensenbrenner has, has a bill that passed the House that talks about hybridizing um, more heavy-duty vehicles, and um, you know, that's a strategy that over a long period of time, if it was able to be successful and all the R&D and so forth worked, um, you know, could have a, a benefit, but the, the, the technology immediately that could be implemented on uh, heavy-duty diesels, where most of the black carbon is coming from in this country, really is the installation of the filters that I described. Um, so these are all complementary strategies, um, and it's important to look at which sector um, and what problem you're trying to address, um, but I think primarily the electrics and plug hybrids would be addressing greenhouse gases from the light-duty automotive sector. The, the Recovery Act, the stimulus package from last uh, February, included $300 million for projects to reduce diesel exhaust, uh, resulting in replacement of old, dirty engines with new, cleaner ones, uh, and in retrofitting engines to uh, capture black carbon and other pollutants. Uh, there is still more to do. Um, could you outline? the remaining needs in the United States and what we can do to reduce black carbon quickly and effectively? Well, first of all, let me, let me commend um, everyone who supported those provisions in the Recovery Act. Those, that's probably the biggest breakthrough in terms of diesel retrofit money that there's been, uh, you know, since DERA was passed. DERA was authorized at $1 billion. Uh, it's typically been uh, funded in the annual appropriation of EPA at around 50 to 60 million dollars. Um, but in the Recovery Act, as you said, it got 300 million. And as I said in my testimony, for that 300 million, EPA received two billion dollars worth of applications. So th that really demonstrates that, that the demand is out there, that people want to participate in the program, both in terms of replacement and retrofits. EPA is, is sitting on about 1.7 billion dollars worth of applications, and their internal reviews suggest that about one billion of those are very high quality. So we have suggested that in, the, in any jobs packages that move that include spending, um, that perhaps, like the Recovery Act, more money could be devoted to the Diesel Emission Reduction Act, and EPA's message is we, <coughs> we can move a billion dollars worth of these immediately because we have the application sitting on our desk. And that would probably be the fastest thing because, you know, the, the, the idea of the Recovery Act and the Jobs Act is to get the money out quickly to create the jobs. Um, the, this, this type of DERA investment uh, was estimated by Keybridge Research to generate about 19,000 jobs per billion dollars invested, which is very favorable when you look at the average of the Recovery Act. So this is a win-win-win. It's a climate win. It's a public health win. It's a jobs win. So probably the most immediate thing that could be done is more funding. Um, Who won the $300 million, Mr. Snyder? How do you mean? <laughs> no, I mean, who, in terms of the, the, the $300 million, you said there were there was a billion dollars worth of applications. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, yes. Who, who, million, won, who, who yes. were the winners? It, it, there were, first of all, a diverse set of, of winners. Um, uh, in, applicants included public entities, included public private entities. So, for example, in a public entity, that might be um, a school district that wanted to retrofit school buses, and not only protect 
the community, but protect the kids on the bus from the fumes from the, uh, from the bus. It would include municipalities that wanted to retrofit their transit buses. Uh, it included contractors who wanted to retrofit their construction fleets, and there was some success in terms of those types of awards. There were other awards in which uh, people used the, the DIRA money to um, almost as a cash for clunkers type of situation. It wasn't a, you know, where they were able to replace uh, existing older vehicles, scrap the, the older ones, and, and, and bring in ones with a new cleaner um, uh, technology. So that would include some private fleets, uh, some state government fleets, and uh, some, some fleets that work uh, on, on contracts for state governments. So there was a, a whole variety of folks in every different, every state in the union, I believe, that were able so to what, build what, what has been the results in terms of the implementation of the, um, the programs that the $300 million have incentivized? Right. Well, well, first of all, um, I think EPA is trying to calculate right now what the emissions benefits have been from that. Uh, and they can do that because um, the, the applications are quite detailed. But uh, that money was able to be uh, awarded very quickly. It's a reimbursement program, so it's taken a little time to, to get um, the money out, but the, the orders came in and those fleets were transformed. I think that's the good news, is that those, uh, many of those fleets were able to take advantage of that and there have been um, you know, announcements around the country where kids are riding cleaner buses to school, people are riding cleaner transit buses to work, uh, ferries have been uh, retrofit so that when they pull into their, uh, their dock, the black smoke doesn't infiltrate uh, the shore. All of those things have been uh, accomplished through the Recovery Act. So I should ask the EPA then to give me their um, that They're report working on an assessment of in that In terms right now. of how successful the $300 million has been. You, asked, you, you said that for a billion dollars it would create how many thousands of jobs? 19,000. So Theoretically, then 6,000 jobs were created with the 300 million. Correct. Okay, so I think it's important for us to uh, get the information on that as well, um, because as you said, it's win, win, and win. Thank you. Um, <coughs> the um, <coughs> re reducing, uh, now again, you, you each, um, I think, made some reference to the fact that acting on this um, black carbon sector should not in any way reduce our activities to reduce CO2 in general. So can each one of you for 30 seconds just, you know, succinctly make your own point on that subject? Let me go to you, Dr. Blonde. The fact that we should not reduce CO2 endeavors because of black carbon. We no, have- No, no, that, that, that we should not reduce our efforts to reduce the CO2. Because Correct. we're also working on the Correct. carbon issue. I think uh, Mr. Schneider said it best. We need both and everything else that we can think of. Right now, we're in a position where we need to act quickly. We don't have the 50 years it will take to come up with new technologies to reduce atmospheric forcing. And so black carbon is a quick solution, but we will still be left with a bill after putting CO2 into the atmosphere. We can't afford to miss either opportunity. Dr. Uh, Amanda Penn. It's, it's important to recognize that black carbon reductions is not, a, it's not, a, it's not supplementing or preventing efforts to reduce CO2 simply because we are adding 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year, and it's increasing at the rate of 2 to 3 percent. If we don't do anything about CO2 emissions, the CO2 concentrations alone in this century can be double, and the warming from that added CO2 can exceed <coughs> 2 degrees. So there's nothing BC reductions is going to stop this. The PC reduction is more a short-term gain to slow down the climate change. Ultimately, that climate change is from CO2, and we have to reduce it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Schindel? Well, in the, in the 90s, the, the UK introduced a, a public health law that, that said that anybody emitting black smoke uh, 
could be deemed a public nuisance, meaning legally actionable. And so this led to the City of London suing the London Underground over a power plant emitting black smoke, which they got out of by claiming it was brown. Um, and I bring this up because the interesting thing about this, as well as being amusing, is this was the 1890s, not the 1990s. And we've known for a long time that, about the public health impacts. And black carbon should be dealt with because it's a public health impact, whether or not it had any climate impact. It, there's an extra impetus now because climate is such a severe problem. And I don't even like the expression that this buys us time because we really don't have any time on the CO2 issue either. That problem is coming down the road. It's simply a different time scale. It, that problem, since CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere and lasts in the atmosphere for centuries, that problem will be with us for a long time, even if we begin to address it right away. And so addressing black carbon and the other short-lived pollutants can help, but really has to be side by side with, with already immediate action on CO2. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. Mr. Chairman, I, I liked your uh, metaphor about the, um, about the house payments, um, uh, down payment and uh, monthly payments. Um, you know, you can, if you, if you, I mean, we have a lot of experience in this particular area right now. If you make a down payment and fail to make the monthly payments, you know what happens. You had a foreclosure. And uh, if we fail to act, if we act on black carbon and make that down payment, but we fail to make the monthly payments we need on the greenhouse gases, uh, our project will fail. And, um, you know, maybe we theoretically have bought ourselves a few years, uh, but we will have squandered that opportunity, that down payment, if we don't follow through and make the necessary reductions in greenhouse gases. It'll take, as I said, both and in order to uh, reach the target levels that people say will avoid uh, the worst effects of global warming. Um, <clears throat> Mother, I wanted to tell you, uh, Dr. Romanathan, the, the reason we're having this hearing is I read this brilliant article that you had in Foreign Affairs, and uh, uh, and uh, you know from a public education uh, perspective, I, if I could have 435 members of Congress read it, I think that we would have a different reaction to the actions that we have to take the recommendations for actions that we have to take in order to solve the problem, but also why it's a smart way to go, you know, because it's something that, you know, can happen relatively quickly and, uh, and you have a big payoff as well. Um, the um, the uh, um, if I could go to India for a second for a second, and, and maybe you could expand a little bit more, Dr. Ramanathan. Um, talk a little bit more about India and other countries and their, their cooking devices and what strategy you would recommend to be implemented and what percentage, what percentage of all black carbon comes just from those cooking mechanisms that are used in, uh, in third world countries? In fact, uh, some of the statistics I'm going to give you comes from the pioneering studies of my colleagues sitting to my right, but we have verified it with observations, uh, collecting isotope data of uh, black carbon. It turns out at least two-thirds of the black carbon over South Asia, includes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, comes from biomass burning in terms of cooking stoves. So there are major... Did, did you say two-thirds from those countries or two-thirds for, for the whole world? No, it's two-thirds from those countries. From those countries. If you look at the total emission <coughs> from India, about two-thirds is from biomass uh, mm -hmm. burning. And uh, almost, uh, you know, I know in, in my own grandmother cooked with these cook stoves, and, 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 and they do that because the food from that is the most delicious, at least I've ever eaten, just like the smoked salmon here. So that's the reason for the difficulty in changing that to LPG stoves and others. But that was the reasons given by all of the nonprofits which I have interacted. But our experience based on this one year in the selected village is that the women are tired of cooking with these uh, you know, uh, traditional mud stoves. It simply takes a long time to collect the fuel and it's a lot of work. And so I think the, uh, uh, the community, at least the communities I have worked with, are ready. We are working in the most densely polluted 
densely populated part of India. It's called the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Over 600 million live there. And, and, and the other beautiful thing which is happening is the Indian government has realized this as a development issue. It's a health issue. And now I have teamed up with some economists in Berkeley and Duke to show that it's also contributing to agriculture decrease of the yield. So all of this is coming together. And also the, the realization it may be impacting the glaciers is also bringing in a lot of communities together. So I think um, my, my personal feeling is the timing is really perfect for a major collaboration between US, bilateral collaboration between US and India to take it to the next stage. Okay, and what is the next stage? How can we, how can Americans change Indian cooking habits? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, the change can happen, my feeling is through technology, transfer of the, you know, storms and various ways to do that. And there are also ways we can remove the black carbon from the chimneys. And so let them use, and, and the third is, of course, funding. Those three, and, and the fourth I want to mention, the key thing is this is what we are doing, we have to document how much of the health in we are saving, exposure studies. And we have to document how much global warming benefit we will get. My personal calculations suggest removing one ton of black carbon in those village will have the same effect as removing 1,000 tons of carbon dioxide in terms of global warming potential. But these are theoretical calculations. So there are a number of scientific engineering and just the question of giving loans to 150 million. So there are varieties of ways in which bilateral collaboration could just push it to the front page. Okay, thank you. The chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from uh, Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I apologize, I'm running between uh, committees. Um, and I, 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 I always like this uh, committee uh, try to try to get here under almost any circumstance just because of how s significant it is. And uh, I walked in on, on the, this conversation. My family is in uh, Tanzania, uh, Arusha, uh, about uh, 400 miles south of Nairobi uh, and at the foot of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, I, I stood out one evening uh, with uh, one of my relatives and uh, we looked up uh, at the moon, and we could actually see, uh, you know, the outline of craters. And I said to him, um, you know, y y you are fortunate in, in many ways over the Western world because, uh, you know, th th there's no pollution. I think in, a, in Arusha, average income, $1,500 a year. Uh, there may be 10 cars, you know, I mean, if, if I'm underestimating, let's say 100 cars on the, on the high side, and yet um, I get on this committee and, and, uh, and start learning about the, the soup that, that, that is there because um, my cousins uh, cook outside. I mean, everybody uh, is cooking outside. In fact, my cousin, believe it or not, in Africa is running a barbecue business. Um, and, and so, you know, people line up outside and, and nobody's thinking about what's going on. And the, but the, the, the concern I have is it's low hanging fruit. We can, we can probably, you know, eliminate that, um, uh, in, intrusion into the, to the, to the atmosphere of black carbon. Uh, but, but how do we do it? I mean, it's, it's, it's something that we know we can do, uh, if we, if we can just, change the culture uh, and also change, I mean, provide some kind of uh, way for, uh, for cooking that, that, that does not uh, uh, pollute. Um, but it's, it's going to cost money. I, I think, and I'm, I'm thinking about my cousin, he, uh, or uh, any of my relatives, they would easily uh, probably go to another form of cooking if they could afford it. And so, in the absence of, 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 of having the money, um, how, I mean, what, what do we do? I mean, is it something that the United States and 
and the polluters, the big polluters, uh, uh, India, China, uh, Europe, uh, it, is that uh, our responsibility or, or, or and are there any suggestions? I'll go tell them. You tell me what to do. You tell me what to do, and I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll go tell them. I know the mayor. Anybody? First of all, this is, this is a big problem, of course. Uh, about, this is about half the people in the world. And there are places to target first to move rapidly. One of those areas is a high population density where that kind of cooking leads to high concentrations and impacts on, on quite a lot of people. And so it's, it's easier to deliver to those groups of people than it would be to deliver to your, your cousin who has a barbecue at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. Forgive me if I've gotten your geography a bit wrong. No, you're right. Um, now, Mr. Markey asked about the role of the United States. And there, there is some funding needed, but we are also in a really good position to develop enabling technologies. For example, um, we find that a better stove can be made not by making a great stove here and delivering it there or by paying them to make a stove, but by developing capacity to build mass production for a combustion chamber so that people there can build their own stoves, but the critical piece is made possible. And so if you think of this as a, as a large-scale problem and we have to solve every single household, it seems big and almost undoable. And I think the role of the United States can be in identifying targeted research and targeted studies and targeted development for those things that are keeping new, clean, better technologies from spreading. And I don't want to underestimate the role of clean fuels as well as clean technology. Uh, clean fuels means not only modern fuels, but also um, methods for um, working on, on crop waste and creating pellets and that sort of thing. So I think we have the vision and we have the capability and we have the history of identifying those trigger points that make a big difference. May I add to that, Chairman? Doctor. The first thing to recognize is that they are the using the most environmental friendly fuel because it's not adding net carbon dioxide to the air if you're cooking with crop residues and cow dung, etc. And the cost of these stuff is such that I think of, for example, India, 750 million depend on this, but 150 million households, that's a $4 billion problem. So I think it's, to me, it's a solvable problem. And it's not, we're not talking about trillions, we're not talking about hundreds of billions. With clever microcredits and others, we could distribute this. One thing I may want to talk to you about the brown clouds or the haze you saw covering Kilimanjaro, where in Africa, part of the pro source of this black carbon is savanna burning. Is what? Savanna burning. So that contributes quite a bit to the, you know, Africa white yes. haze plus the cooking. Both are sources. Uh, now, let me follow. Uh, uh, when I used to have knees, I, I could go up to to the top of Kilimanjaro, uh, and you know, if, if if any of you've done it, you know, you start at the bottom, and you're in very tropical clothing because it's, I mean, <coughs> the temperature is going to be, you know. Uh, at, at the century mark, and the higher you go, the colder it gets. Oh, okay. And so you start changing. Uh, by the time you get to the top, you're on snow. Uh, and so that was a while, a while back. Now you get to the top, and you may see little sprinkles of snow. Uh, it, all, the, the snow on, on Kilimanjaro, is, it, it hasn't completely vanished, but it, it's, it's going there. And, and uh, I, in, in reading through the, the testimony and, 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 and becoming a little more familiar with uh, this issue, I started wondering uh, in this land where they're, you know, they, uh, the, the Kilimanjaro airport is not far from the mountain. Uh, and and start, I'm starting to think, well, maybe, you know, more planes are landing in here. Maybe that's what's doing, what, what's doing the damage because there's no industry. The industry there is, is um, 
the Western world stealing all the, the water to, to do plants to, so that we can have fresh plants and hotels every morning. Uh, but that's another whole, whole issue. Uh, so so I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm wondering if the haze is, if what causes that haze is the same thing that's causing, causing the, the melting of the snow. I comment on that first is you have to understand when you see the haze above your head, particularly if it's above a mile, it it's may have nothing to do with the local source. These things transport almost thousands of kilometers. For example, in the dry season between, April, uh, between October to April, the entire Arabian Sea and the North Indian Ocean is filled with haze. It's transported both from the South Asian side and from Africa. So I, I would think, and we have seen elevated regions of the Himalayas covered with thick brown clouds. You know, we've been there, we have taken pictures with aircraft. So the issue of the whole Kilimanjaro, as you know, its retreat, originally it used to be thought it was all due to global warming. Now gl some glaciologists have you know, estimated at least half of that, a lot of it is coming from really what we call sublimation, just the air becoming dry and the snow evaporating. So there are multiple causes happening in Kilimanjaro. But I would point out no one has taken a look at really what this black carbon is doing to that retreat. It's an area of new research to find out. But we know from satellite images, the soot plumes hover around the Kilimanjaro region. Dr. Shindale. Dr. Shindale, were you going to? Well, I, I was going to comment on the, on the previous yes. a little bit, which was, uh, you know, I, I if, if, say, the Waxman-Markey bill becomes, becomes law in this country, there will be a price on carbon like there is in much of the world. And I, I would think that it is not necessarily a useful thing to link funding that has been associated with the greenhouse gases that are controlled under the Kyoto Protocol, if the clean development mechanism whereby the United States and other wealthy countries pay for reductions in other countries. I don't, I don't think it makes sense to link those with the short-term pollutants like black carbon, because as we've talked about, they operate on very different timescales. But analogous sources, for example, there was a, an on a p editorial in the Wall Street Journal about a global methane fund, where the U.S. could help other countries to pay for uh, reductions, or a global black carbon fund. I think all of these kind of ways that the United States can help the developing world to do things like, you know, intervene in uh, residential cooking stoves are quite sensible, but I really think we need partners there. And I, I'm uh, chair of a United Nations Environment Program assessment of the effects of black carbon and ozone on climate. And what we're really trying to do is bring in the developing world scientists. As, Tam, as Dr. Bond was mentioning, you know, there's capacity there too, and I think if those scientists are able to convince their countries that these things are really in their own best interest because they're damaging their ability to grow crops to feed their population. They're affecting their development goals by, you know, air pollution is one of the leading causes of adverse health impacts in the developing world. If it's in their own interest and there's this additional kind of carrot of having funding from developing nations to help them do something about it, I think that's a combination that would actually help to get something done. Yeah, it's a, it's a major challenge because um, the, the, the people who live in this area, um, the Maasai tribe, uh, which inhabits this, this particular area, they know nothing about global warming. I mean, you're, you're talking, uh, uh, I mean, you may as well keep talking, speaking English. I mean, uh, because they, ha they have no idea what you're talking about when you start talking about global warming because all they know is that the snow on, on the mountain is, is uh, not as thick as it used to be. That, that's all they know. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they've not had any intellectual uh, conversations or debates and, uh, about it, and nobody is, is uh, bringing issues forward. It is a challenge to, to us because I, I, I think, you know, we, we are partially responsible for, for much of what, what they experience. 
So uh, I, I don't know, I, I, wanted to, I, I simply wanted to get some kind of reading on this because I'm, I guess maybe I'm personally uh, you know, involved in it and, and I was hoping that, uh, and, and I still hold out hope uh, that uh, the uh, Waxman Market Bill will, will, will be approved um, and if we need to tweak it later, um, I, I like a, a world black carbon fund idea. Uh, I think if we tweak it later, uh, we, it, 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 it can be the major step to save the planet. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you, um, Mr. Cleaver, very much. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask each one of you to give us your one-minute summation of what it is that you want us to remember, um, which is a test because you have a lot that you want us to uh, know about these subjects. Uh, and we'll go in reverse order of the opening statements, and we will begin with you, Mr. Schneider. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I'm going to just tick off the, the, the policy pieces that you really asked me to address today. The, the first one is uh, funding through the climate bill, um, if it's, we're lucky enough to have one, uh, funding for the Diesel Emission Reduction Act, either through the jobs bill or reauthorization and funding, uh, and uh, funding through a transportation bill reauthorization, which requires clean construction equipment and funds it as a part of that tr transportation bill. And then lastly, um, the ability, given the EPA the regulatory authority to cover more of the existing in-use diesels uh, that um, uh, you know, could require the use of today's technology to reduce the black carbon emissions from them. We've had a good discussion just now about the cook stove issue. I'm not going to add to that. Um, I do talk about the methane, I mean the, um, the black carbon fund in my written testimony, so I'd refer you to that. And then lastly, we haven't talked as much about the agricultural burning issue. That's an, an, an issue that de deserves more attention. It's going to require international cooperation and enforcement of uh, national laws in other countries to really accomplish that. But we probably can't get the full benefits of black carbon reductions unless we address that. So thank you very much for the time today. I appreciate it. Dr. Schindel. Well, I would start by reiterating that we have two problems, a long-term climate change problem and a near-term climate change problem. And, and we can't deal with the long-term problem without beginning to reduce carbon dioxide emissions as soon as possible. But for the near-term problem, I, I, I think that consideration of the short-lived warming agents, as we're talking about today, and not just black carbon, but also methane, carbon monoxide and volatile organic carbons, which are often emitted by similar processes. For example, the diesel particulate filters we've been talking about substantially reduce about 90% black carbon, but also carbon monoxide and volatile organics. So if you target all of these as a basket, you're likely to make more effective decisions, reductions that can lead to significant uh, improvements in air quality as well as mitigating climate change. And I just repeat the summary of, of my testimony that reductions in emissions of, of products of incomplete combustion will virtually always improve health. And if targeting emissions that are rich in black carbon, carbon monoxide, VOCs, and methane, you can often find options whose co-benefits are so large that they can simultaneously mitigate climate change and improve air quality at substantially reduced cost. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Amanathan. You know, the Copenhagen Accord requires us to limit climate change to less than two degrees for pre-industrial. We have already put enough greenhouse gases on the planet. According to our climate models, they would already warm the planet by two degrees. So, and we are losing time. So we have a Herculean task in front of us to meet the Copenhagen Accord. And I consider black carbon reductions as an important component of our battle to meet that two degree warming. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bond. Thank you very much. We've discussed some emission sources that produce black carbon and other pollutants. And we've also discussed how there's the long term and the, and the short term effect. What I really want you to think about is that we have a portfolio of potential solutions that can address climate change in the long term and the short term. So don't think about either or. Think about how will we manage the atmospheric trajectory 
during our lifetimes and our children's lifetimes and our grandchildren's lifetimes. And our lifetime is a significant component of that and of interest to many people. The United States has the opportunity to lead <coughs> in both technology and in engagement internationally in this endeavor. There are ways to improve both climate and human welfare at the same time. I'll, I'll leave it there. We have a lot in front of us, but we have a lot of solutions, and I think we have a lot of opportunities. Thank you very much. And, and, and a lot of opportunities to create new jobs, a lot of opportunities to engage in technological transfer, a lot of incredibly great side benefits from working on this problem if we uh, do so in a way that uh, sees the opportunities as well. We thank all of you for your tremendous testimony and for your incredible work on this subject. That's what made it possible for us to have this hearing today. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>